Hello and welcome back, I'm Xanthus. I'm going to be giving you a rundown today of the developer livestream which gave us the information that we know currently about Season 1 of Diablo 4. On a personal note, we are going to be rebranding this channel from Xanthus Gaming into Goblin Gaming and I'm going to have several other community members helping contribute to the content so make sure you check back for more information and more guides, videos, etc. in the future. Like, favorite, share, subscribe, etc, etc. Let's get on into this. All right, so season one is going to be called the Season of Malignants. It is going to be dropping on July 20th, and there is going to be a pre-patch on the 18th. Let's go ahead and go over some of the basics before we get into the specifics of the season. Let's talk about the progress and pace of development for this game moving forward. So first off, let's go ahead and start with the burning question that everyone wants to know is what is going to carry over from Renown. I have to say from the live stream, this is pretty much the only thing that disappointed me. I kind of get where they're coming from on this, but I'm a, I'm honestly a bit disappointed because I got some conflicting information before and apparently it was incorrect. But here is the actual information straight from the developers themselves. With your Renown, it will not all carry over. However, a good portion of it will. If you're looking at the world tier screen and you're looking at the different zones, it's going to be the areas that have been discovered that's going to carry over and the altars of Lilith that are going to carry over. This is by no means all of the renown. However, it is a large portion of it and the altars of Lilith and map discovery were probably the most painful parts that you don't just naturally do while playing the game. So if you're looking at it, you hit tab, you hit W, right? The parts that are going to carry over, keep in mind this is an alt, not my main. Obviously you can see I've done everything on my main, but the parts that are going to carry over are going to be the areas discovered and the altars of Lilith. They said that this is basically going to mean you get the first and second tiers fully unlocked and you'll be about halfway through the third tier. That means that you're going to have five starting skill points and nine starting potions. As you work your way through the remainder of the game, as you're leveling up, you'll do side dungeons, you'll do strongholds, you'll do side quests. That's how you're going to unlock the rest. Unfortunately, you do still have to unlock that painful final step, but hopefully it shouldn't be too bad because we're just going to do it as we're leveling. The way it currently exists within the game, if you're in a party and let's say I'm in one dungeon and my friend is in another dungeon. If I complete my dungeon, he still gets credit for it, even though he's in a completely different dungeon. They may change this, they may fix this, but if they don't, then the most effective way to level and to complete this Renown without it being mind-numbingly terrible is going to be to get into a group of four, have each one of your people go into a different dungeon, complete it, and then everybody gets credit, so you're doing four dungeons at once. It should knock this out very quickly and help you level up very, very fast. Again, they might change that, but presently, that is how it functions within the game. On top of this, you're going to want to prioritize the dungeons that are the Whispers. So if you're looking at the map, there are certain dungeons that are Whispers. You go to those first. Don't do them if you've already completed them, but if you have not yet completed them, have somebody do those and then move on to other ones. This is going to double dip into the Whispers experience that you're going to get bonuses from and should help the leveling experience significantly. They said that their original intent was to not have any of the Renown carryover, which would have been just terrible, uh, but they adjusted this due to community feedback. Due to that adjustment, there are some technical limitations in the implementation of the map discovery aspect of this. In order to actually get your map uncovered on your new characters and all of your existing ones, as you can see here, this is an alt. He doesn't have everything uncovered, right? So in order to get that to propagate forward, starting on July 18th, when they do their pre-patch, July 20th is when the season launches, Starting on July 18th, when they do their pre-patch, you just have to log into your character that has the most progress, or just log into all of them probably. And what it will do is it will push that information for the maps and for the altars forward to all of your other characters. So it will retroactively update your existing characters, as well as give you that experience and those maps and stuff to start on your new characters. So once I've logged in on July 18th, I load in, I click it, and it's gonna and it's going to import over my Altars of Lilith and my areas discovered, okay? 
Now, with that out of the way, let's talk about the length and balance of seasons. They did say that they are intending for seasons to be a minimum of 12 weeks long. After those 12 weeks, you will get an update from the Diablo team where they are going to tell you their intent on the end of the current season and the start of the next season. <coughs> Excuse me. Judging by past experience with Diablo 3, they usually give you about a month's head up, heads up before they end a season. So that means most likely most seasons will be in the range of 14 to 16 weeks long, likely with a two week break between them. You can kind of extrapolate the data and figure out when season two would start based upon that. But we won't know the specifics until we are 12 weeks into the current season, which again starts on July 20th. They also touched on balance changes during the season. Their intent is to not massively, massively shake up balance in the middle of the season. They're going to try to do that in pre-patches right before the season starts. Uh, they're going to be doing a client patch today, which is going to have some significant changes. And I would likely expect they have at least one more before the season starts in two weeks. Barring any unforeseen, massively imbalanced things, they're not going to be doing balancing patches during the season. Now, they did specifically say, you know, it's possible that with the new mechanics they're going to put in, which we're going to talk about in a few minutes, it could create some severe imbalances. It could create some, you know, graphics card issues, those kind of things. Those kind of things they will address right away if there's major issues with the game. Uh, but outside of that, they intend on having the seasons be relatively stable. So if you have a class and you know, for instance, Necromancer is top tier at the beginning of the season, it's going to be top tier at the end of the season. If Rogue is trash at the beginning of the season, it's going to be trash at the end of the season, probably. Now, that's by no means how things are right now. That's just like rough examples, right? Okay, hopefully that makes sense. Another thing they did mention is that they recognize that the end game activities are not all as rewarding as they should be at the moment. They specifically called out Helltides and Whispers of the Dead and mentioned, and this surprised me because I did not know this, but they mentioned that those two activities cannot actually drop unique items. So if you're farming Helltide chests and you're trying to target farm uniques and you're like, why the heck can I not find that unique while well, target farming that Helltide? Well, that's why, apparently. And that actually kind of pisses me off a little bit, but whatever, it's fine. Uh, they said they will actually be fixing the Helltide thing today with a client patch. So as of today, you should be able to target farm uniques with Helltides. Uh, they did not specifically say they are fixing the Whispers of the Dead today. However, they did mention it during the live stream. So I would expect that it will be fixed in the future. They also said they will be increasing the rewards for various end game activities before the start of the season. They did not go into more specifics about that, but I would make sure to check the patch notes that they're going to post for the client patch today and see if you can find any information about that. Now, uh, that said, they are going to be doing a 1.04 balance patch today where they're going to be pushing out a number of changes, including the fix to the health hides. So make sure you check in for that and see where that ends up. Now, as far as season mechanics carrying over, some of us have played other games such as Path of Exile. And Path of Exile, what they do is each new league, they introduce a new mechanic. If the mechanic is favorably received by the community, then they move it into their core game. This is nice, but also is a double-edged sword because as anyone knows who's tried playing Path of Exile, who's not like super, super hardcore into it and been playing for years and years, it's very, very hard to get into that game. It's very, very hard to play it unless you're a hardcore Path of Exile player. I have played a lot of Path of Exile, and I still find myself overwhelmed by the sheer complexity and number of systems in the game. They said they don't want that for Diablo 4. They didn't mention Path of Exile by name, but that's what they were implying. Uh, but they did say they are open to the idea that if a mechanic is very well received and people really like it, they might move it over into the Eternal Realm. However, it might require some tweaks to numbers and some, you know, functionality changes. Uh, because some of these are going to be so game-changing, so power-increasing, that if they didn't do that, the game's complexity would bloat to absurd levels, and then people wouldn't want to play it. <laughs> Path of Exile. Uh, I know it's still a really popular game, but I, I can't get most of my friends to play it because it's just too complex, right? So anyway, they're going to try to prevent that from happening, but still, if something is well-received, they're going to move it over into the core game, possibly, but they're not guaranteeing it. 
They also mention the fact that if they continually introduce new mechanics and move them into a core game over and over and over again, it's just going to make the power creep unmanageable and it's going to make things absurd, a la D3. Actually makes perfect sense. Now that said, there is some precedent for them doing this in the past. They introduced Echoing Nightmares in Diablo 3. It was very well received. The community loved it. They moved it into a core game with some changes, and it's fantastic. So I look forward to seeing that in the future. Alright, so that's the basics about kind of their intent on pace, etc. Now we're going to start looking at the specifics of the season, the story, the mechanics, the new campaign stuff etc. So let's go ahead and dive into that. Okay, so the first thing to know is that the new season is going to introduce a new section of the campaign. This is not a continuation of the Lilith storyline that has more or less concluded for now at least. This is a branching side story after the Lilith campaign ends. Now that said, you still do need to complete the main campaign up through the end of the Lilith campaign in order to unlock the new branching story. And you need to complete the new branching story in order to unlock the new malignant mechanic within the season. So if you have not yet completed the story on your Eternal Realm character, that is definitely something you're going to want to do before the new season starts. The new story is going to be centering around a gentleman named Cormand, and basically the TLDR of it, we'll show the trailer here in a second, but the TLDR of it is that a new threat is spreading through Sanctuary. It is a disease that is affecting everybody, animals, humans, and demons, is corrupting them from the inside out, removing their consciousness essentially, and turning them into bloodthirsty animals. This new guy named Cormand is a former member of the Cathedral of Light, and he thinks he has found a way to combat it. In true Diablo fashion, his way to combat it is to rip their heart out, break down its essence, and then reform it to utilize as a power source. Hmm, what could possibly go wrong with that? He can't do it himself, so he needs our help to do it, and that is the crux of the season and what we're going to be doing within the season. Now, once again, you do need to complete the new branching story path before it unlocks this mechanic. Presumably, you would start doing this after you've hit a certain point in the leveling progress, but you might be able to do it straight from the beginning. If that's the case, I would do that first before you start knocking out your dungeons. It wasn't really made clear whether you can start right away on that or whether you have to hit like World Tier 3 first. So we'll just kind of have to wait and see on that. Hopefully they give us some more clarity over the next week or two. Uh, but anyway, it looks really, really good. Let's go ahead and take a second and look at that trailer, and then we're going to get into the mechanics of what the different things are that are included with the seat. I am writing to you because although a great evil is receding from Sanctuary, a new festering curse now spreads its corruption across the land. More dangerous, more malignant than I could have imagined. I have found a way to stop this plague. To rip the dark power of these monsters from their very core and turn it to our advantage in destroying them. This alone. My allies have fallen. My strength is dwindling. The malignant are relentless and without mercy. I need help. I need you. So yeah, it looks uh, honestly very cool. Um, the new mechanics also look pretty cool. Let's go ahead and take a look at those now. Uh, there's going to be kind of a few different mechanics that we're going to be looking at as we move through this, including, of course, Season Journey and Battle Pass, but also just new mechanics added into the game and how the game functions. So first, we're going to talk about the Malignant Threat. What I'm going to do is I'm going to pull up the live stream. I'm going to mute it in the background so you can kind of watch it playing as I'm talking about things. I'll get queued up to the appropriate point and we'll kind of explain what we're seeing here. 
I took copious notes throughout so that we could break down that hour and a half live stream into a much more manageable, maybe like half hour-ish segment. So let's go ahead and take a look at the malignant threats, malignant hearts, malignant tunnels, and then we'll look at the battle pass and all that stuff. And by the way, just to put your mind at ease, there is no pay to win. It's not Diablo Immortal. Thank God. Okay, so essentially, whenever you're playing Diablo 4 in Season 1, there's going to be things called malignant threats. And the concept behind that is anytime that you encounter a elite during your progress through the game, it has a chance to be a malignant monster like you're seeing here. It will not always be a malignant monster, but it can oftentimes be one. Malignant monsters are a little bit tougher than your standard elites. They have extra affixes such as Brutal. I don't know if there's any others. That's the only one they showed off. Uh, but those extra affixes make them harder. So when you run into them, you kill them once. After you kill them, they drop a uh, little item on the ground here called a Malignant Heart. And what you have to do is you have to cage that heart. Once you cage that heart, it's going to start a new event where it resummons the monster you just killed. And that monster is now going to be stronger and tougher and he's going to call in allies as reinforcements. It's kind of like a survival event like we have in the game already, right? So once you survive that, you kill the monster and kill his allies, you're going to get what's called a caged heart. Now that caged heart is what you're going to use in order to get your new malignant hearts that are going to be super powerful items. Uh, they are basically socketed into the jewel crafter slots. So you've got your rings, you've got your amulets. It's going to go into those slots. This seems to be akin to the legendary gems in Diablo 3. The developer specifically said that they are slightly higher power level than the existing legendaries within the game and should provide huge power spikes. Now these hearts are going to come in four colors. They mentioned red and blue. I don't know what the third color is. I'm presuming like yellow maybe. Uh, but the fourth type of malignant heart is called a wrathful, excuse me, wrathful malignant heart. Now the wrathful malignant hearts are like a tier above all the rest. These ones are super powerful and actually super rare as well. They mentioned that you only probably find a few within your season and they are completely game changing similar to uniques. Now, every time a amulet or ring drops within season one, it's going to come with these special sockets that are only usable with malignant hearts. They did not indicate whether the existing sockets will still be there or if this is a always kind of thing, but they did specifically say whenever you add a socket to any piece of jewelry, it will be this new special type of socket. These sockets are color coded, as are the gems themselves, and obviously you have to kind of mess them up. They also mentioned that these uh, these new hearts slash gems, whatever you want to call them, are going to scale with level and scale with world tier, similar to how our items currently scale with world tier. So I'd be looking out for that. Uh, they also mentioned once again that your old ones are not completely worthless because you can actually salvage the old hearts that you no longer need in order to make a special item that is used in the new mechanic called Malignant Tunnels. Now these Malignant Tunnels are going to be specific dungeons within the world. It wasn't really clear whether these are going to be hell ties and randomly spawn or if they're going to be static locations. Uh, but you're going to use these crafted items, which are called invokers, inside of these tunnels in order to be able to target farm these hearts. These special dungeons are going to have an increased number of malignant monsters within. The example they showed of a malignant heart was that of a electric one that had kind of a conduit type effect that when you crit it has a chance to kind of proc those conduit lightning arcs out. So it seems pretty strong. But anyway, the malignant tunnels are going to be these specific areas where you can farm these hearts. Uh, as you run through this, it's going to again, as I said, have an increased chance to have malignant monsters spawn within it. But more importantly, there is going to be a special thing that's only found within these tunnels, which are called malignant masses. 
and these malignant masses are how you're going to target farm these hearts. You can kind of see them running through one of these malignant tunnels, and there's your malignant mass. Oops, I accidentally paused my mic instead of pausing the video. Ha! Notice how there are two postures here on the screen, right? There's this one here and this one here. I assume that these are the two different colors because they said when they were doing the live stream that you can choose which color heart you want to try to spawn. So presumably, I guess gray is maybe our other color, I'm not sure, but that's obviously a blue one. He clicks on that, he spawns the malignant monster that is blue, and then he fights and kills it. Now these monsters that spawn when you're doing the malignant tunnels um, using these new special items that you craft, you don't have to kill them twice, you only kill them once. It spawns right away as the second version of the Elite. Uh, so you'll see that here in just a second. And they have a chance to drop that heart. It did not say it was guaranteed, unfortunately. He said a chance, and I think that was very intentional language. So that is something to take note of. So if you use as he places the Invoker on this new mechanic, it spawns the new Firebrand Brutal Malignant. Uh, do note that, oops, let me skip back there, hold on a second, I'll get back to that point. There we go. Alright, so do note that these are tougher than the standard malignant monsters that you find out in the world, and they also specifically said that the malignant hearts that you get from inside the malignant tunnels are actually of a higher quality than the ones that you find elsewhere out in the world. So that is something to keep in mind, but if you want to target farm this new mechanic, the malignant hearts, you do that within the malignant tunnels. So that's essentially our new mechanic that is in for this season. But there's a couple more mechanics kind of wrapped up into the battle pass, so let's go ahead and take a look at that as well as the season journey so that we can kind of look at how that works. Let's look at the season journey first. Alright, so the Season Journey is available to everybody, whether you purchase the Battle Pass or not. In fact, the Battle Pass is available to everyone, whether you purchase the Premium version or not. So that is something that's important to know as well. There is no pay for power within the Battle Pass, so you do not have to worry about that. I'm going to say that again, there is no pay for power. This is not Diablo Immortal, thank God. So, yay. If you played Diablo 3, the Season's Journey in this game seems very similar to Season's Journey in Diablo 3, with a few exceptions. In Diablo 3, in order to progress your Season Journey chapters, you had to complete every objective from move, to move from one Season Journey chapter to the next. That's not the case here. You earn what's called Favor as you work through the Season's Journey. This Favor is used to unlock the next chapter of the journey. This favor can also just drop from randomly doing things out in the world as you're leveling, such as dungeons or hell ties, etc. So you don't have to do the objectives necessarily, you can just get it elsewhere too. That said, in order to do the season's journey, if you were to do nothing but the quest objectives, you still do not have to do every single objective. So for instance, say you hate doing certain dungeons, or you hate collecting gallo vine herbs, or you hate doing cellars, you don't have to engage in the content that you don't want to engage in. You can kind of pick the way that you want to progress your journey and pick and choose which quests you want to do. In the end, all you have to do is earn X amount of favor to move on to the next objective. Make sense? Great. So, what do you get from the season's journey? You get new items, you get new cosmetics, most importantly, you get new aspects for your characters, which is new legendary powers. Once you unlock them in the season, they are also a lot unlocked in your eternal realm going forward. Okay. Also should be noted that when the pre-patch hits on July 18th, all the new legendaries and all the new uniques that they are putting into the game for the season are also available in Legacy, sorry, um, Eternal Realm going forward as well. So as soon as July 18th hits, all those new legendaries, all those uniques are going to be in both modes of the game. So that's actually kind of cool. One other important thing to know about the season's journey is that in order to actually progress to the next chapter of the season's journey or to progress the season journey in general, you have to have completed not only the base campaign, but you also have to have completed the new branching path campaign before you can progress your journey. This would indicate that that's 
probably the first thing we're doing, but again, they did not say whether it's locked behind a specific level or not, so we'll just kind of have to wait and see. But you do have to complete the campaign before you can progress your season's journey. At least that's how they phrased it. Alright, let's go ahead and take a look at the Battle Pass next. Okay, so what's the difference between the Premium and the Free Battle Pass? Basically, with the Premium Battle Pass, there are some cosmetics that are locked only to the Premium Battle Pass. And when you purchase the Premium Battle Pass, you can skip ahead tiers within both Battle Passes. Now that said, you may be thinking, well, but if you can skip ahead tiers, Xanthus, aren't you paying for power? Well, no, you're not, because all of the things that are power related are locked behind a specific level requirement. For instance, one of the new mechanics are called Ashes. These Ashes are earned as currency by progressing your battle pass and then they're used to purchase power for your character. These Ashes cannot be purchased in any way outside of the game and can only be earned within the game itself and in order to unlock the ability to get Ashes, you have to be a minimum of level 40. They specifically said that if you're playing the game normally, when you hit 40, that should be about the point where you're at that tier in the battle pass, so the skips in no way really affect the power of your character. They only give you the cosmetics quicker. So, yay, that's good. No pay for power. Now that said, if you did purchase the deluxe version of the game, you automatically have the premium battle pass to start, so you do not have to purchase it again for this season. They did not indicate that that will be true for future seasons, and I would not expect it to be true for future seasons, so please keep that in mind. As you work through the different tiers of the Battle Pass, most of the beginning tiers appear to be cosmetic only, but the cosmetics are class agnostic, so if you unlock them on one class, they are going to be unlocked on all classes. So, for instance, if you unlock it on your Rogue and you get this cool piece of armor for your Rogue, it's going to be unlocked on your Rogue, but then if you switch over to your Sorceress, it's going to adapt that piece of armor to look how it would look for the Sorceress, and then it's unlocked across all characters. The exception to that, of course, is if you don't have access to a weapon type on a certain type of character. So, for instance, you know, if you're playing Barbarian, you're not using staves, right? You're not going to have that cosmetic for your Barbarian, but Outside of that one restriction, it is kind of account-wide character, no matter what character you have that cosmetic. They also did mention that whenever you unlock cosmetics in either the Eternal or the Seasonal Realm, it is unlocked across both realms. So here they're showing the Ashes mechanic. So once you hit tier 8 of the Battle Pass progression, you can start getting Smoldering Ashes. And then you can use those Smoldering Ashes to purchase account-wide power boosts for your characters within seasonal only. Important to note. You'll notice here there's a variety of things you can increase, such as the effect of the hearts, the XP bonuses that you get from killing monsters, you can make your elixirs last longer, you can get higher material quality from salvaging, you can get more gold from selling items. Uh, they specifically went into the elixirs a little bit. They said that, you know, if you get all four tiers of the elixir, then you're going to get an additional 20 minutes of your elixir time. That would indicate that each tier is going to give you five additional minutes of elixir, which is really, really nice because, I mean, you burn through those things. And it's easy to forget about them because they go through so quick. So that is going to be absolutely wonderful. They also mentioned, the only other really thing that they mentioned about the Battle Pass is that when you hit the very end of it, you're going to get a special item called a Scroll of Amnesia. The Scroll of Amnesia is going to give you full respect for your character at no cost whenever you want to use it. Once you use it, of course, it consumes it. This is going to wipe out all your talent points and wipe out all your Paragon board and just reset it so you can respec without having to pay to do that. Uh, they did mention, and we'll go into this in a second, uh, they did mention they're still working on a quick, easy way to reset the Paragon board, but they don't have it ready yet outside of the Scroll of Amnesia. Kind of a little weird, but whatever. Um, but that is there for you, so you can use that to get a quick respec once you hit a certain point. You're like, okay, I've went through my leveling stuff, I've went through my initial gearing stuff, I've collected the stuff I want for what I want my build to eventually be. Let's use that amnesia, let's switch from Ice Shard Sorceress to Meteor Sorceress, or let's switch from Ren Barbarian to Whirlwind, or you know, whatever, however you want to do it, but it's kind of cool. 
that is more or less what they gave us as far as information about the new mechanics and the new things being added to the seasons. They did tease a little bit in addition to that about some future plans that they have. They mentioned specifically that they are working on a way to make respecting Paragon boards quicker and easier and smoother. It is a priority, but they don't have a good system in place yet. The only thing they have in place so far is that scroll of amnesia that wipes everything. But they're looking to develop a way to just do a reset of the boards. I would imagine they're looking for ways to reset, like remove this one board or remove all boards, giving you some options. They said it's not ready yet, but it is a priority based on community feedback they've received. They also mentioned they are still working on getting that dual uh, tab moved into our character just stats page. That's something they're still working on. It's not quite ready yet. And they have also heard a lot of community feedback about making the stash space larger or moving some things into a character or account wide like character sheet like we have with our veiled crystals, etc. That is something they are currently working on. However, they are not ready to roll it out yet. They did say it is of the utmost priority. They are fast tracking it. It is their main focus right now as far as quality of life improvements. They are working on getting it out and they will get it out as soon as they can, but it is not yet ready sad face but at least it's coming so yay they also at the very end kind of said do we have any plans to announce a new class for diablo 4 and the answer to that was no not yet um that's probably because they also announced a new class for diablo immortal which actually looks really cool kind of sucks because that game's evil but uh i'd imagine they're gonna let that settle for a little bit before they announce the new class for diablo 4 since they're not announcing it now, it's obviously not going to come in Season 1. I would assume that they're probably going to announce a new class for Season 2. Based on some existing data mined and leaked info, it looks quite likely that it's probably going to be a Paladin, but it's not 100% confirmed yet, so we'll just kind of have to stay tuned and see. Hopefully this video was helpful for you. We managed to take an hour and a half live stream and boil it down to a half hour of information with as little nonsense as possible. I know it was still a little bit longer than I would have liked, but hopefully it was helpful for you guys. Make sure you like, favorite, share, subscribe down below, and we will see you next time. Bye, y'all.